Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get down on my knees and go before the Lord in prayer. If you could just do me the honor and, and do the honor to the Lord, if, if you can stand if you're able. Let's stand together as we go before the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you in this place. And Lord, we're just grateful for the opportunity that we have to come to church, to come into the house of the Lord. Your word says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Father, why? Because your word also tells us that when two or more are gathered together, there you are in the midst of them. And Lord, we thank you that we can come together as a congregation, as brothers and sisters in Christ, to not hear from a woman. Lord, we don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman or to hear from a band. Lord, we don't come to church to be entertained, but Lord, we can gather together in the house of the Lord to hear from you. We fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is a senior leader of this church. And Lord, it's in the name of Jesus that we ask that your Holy Spirit would minister to us tonight to speak to us. Lord, I ask that you would open our ears to hear and our eyes to see your word, that we would that would be that it would be a seed sown on good ground in our hearts, that we would walk out of this building, Father, and we would truly be the church to a lost and dying world. Lord, and we don't ask the blessings upon ourselves, solely upon ourselves, but Lord, we ask that upon all the brothers and sisters in Christ and all the churches around the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and teaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that you set your hand upon them. Lord, our Catholic brothers and sisters, our Adventists and Baptists and Methodist brothers and sisters, our Episcopalian brothers and sisters, our Seventh-day Adventist brothers and sisters, our Lutheran brothers and sisters. Lord, we lift up all the churches in the Inland Empire to you. Too many to, to, to mention by name, but Father, we lift up Emmanuel Baptist and Harvest Christian Fellowship. Lord, we lift up Abundant Living and, and Oak Valley. Lord, we lift up Ecclesia to you, Inland, Inland Christian Center. Father, we lift up the Way World Outreach, Sandals, The Grove. Lord, all the churches all across the world and all across the Inland Empire. Lord, we don't see ourselves as better than anybody else. But Lord, we truly do see ourselves as co-laborers in the body of Christ. Lord, many members serving one purpose in the body to build your kingdom. Lord, and we give you the praise. Lord, and we give you the glory and give you the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, I'm excited for what God's got in store for you, for us tonight through the word of the Lord. He gave you, as I was beginning to study and as beginning to read the word of the Lord, I was actually yesterday, obviously today being December 26th, the day after Christmas, I heard on one radio station, they called it Chris, Christmas instead of Christmas. It's Christmas today because you've got all that wrapping paper and the, and the trash cans and the food and the refrigerator's bloated and you're bloated and everything else. You've got all the things going on. But today is that day after Christmas. And, and today I want to talk to you a little, a little bit about it. I was, as I was reading the Christmas message yesterday, as we were putting our son uh, to bed, we always read from the Bible, or he has one of those little children's Bibles that's like the little picture stories, and we were reading to him the story of Jesus, and, and I was reading the, the story, and I was just realizing that there's so much more to Christmas than just one day. So today what I want to talk to you about is keeping the spirit of Christmas. Now, it's December 26th. You're already moved on. It's already, you're already looking for, you know, next, next Tuesday, the new, the new year. You're looking forward to that rose parade or whatever else you're going to do on that new year. And, and, you know, you're looking forward to, to 2013, seeing what's going on. But so here I am talking about the past. Here I am talking about Christmas. But one of the things I want to talk to you about is, is first of all, I, wanna, I really thought long and hard about the title. Because I wanted to talk today about keeping the spirit of Christmas. One of the things that my family and I discussed as we were watching all of the kids tear into all their Christmas presents and there was just wrapping paper flying everywhere and, and the ground was covered. You couldn't see anybody or see anything because all the grandkids were at grandma and grandpa's house just ripping into all their presents. And we were talking about Christmas as it is today. And, you know, Christmas as it is today and Christmas as it was 2,000 years ago. Now, obviously, we know that December 25th is not the day that Jesus was born on. It's a day some 300 years after the, after the death of Christ that the Roman Emperor Constantine made it the, the official day of Christmas. But that's, a, that's another, for another day. You can take church history in March in the Bible College. I teach that. And um, we can talk about it more then. But... The fact of the matter is, is that Christmas in our day and age is totally different than Christmas, what it was 10 years ago, 20 years, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. But there's something similar in all about Christmas, and that is that there's a spirit behind it. There's something about the holiday season. I know if you have family, you know about it. Hey, listen, you might even feel the difference. There's something about it. Why people become even more happy? Or, hey, listen to this. Why people become more sad? Because there's a presence there, there's a spirit there that reminds us about the things that we have, or in some cases, the things that we don't have. And today I want to talk to you about the spirit of Christmas, about keeping the spirit of Christmas, because you see, Christmas goes well beyond the birth 
of, of, of Jesus, the birth of baby Jesus. As a matter of fact, you know, I just had, a, uh, my wife just had our baby girl, Emma, three weeks ago tomorrow. And, you know, the interesting thing about babies and the interesting thing about births is that the birthday is just one day. But the celebration truly is every day. I tell you, grandma and grandpa and aunts and uncles and everybody and their mama is calling me and texting me and hitting my wife up on Facebook and everything else. How's the baby? How's the baby? How's the baby? How's the baby? It's it's an ongoing thing. See, the birth is just a start. The interesting thing is I was reading, talking about keeping on the spirit of Christmas and continuing the theme of Christmas beyond December 25th and beyond the month of December in general all the way out until, let's say, Christmas in July. I don't know what that's all about, but we always hear about that term. But carrying that theme of Christmas because, you see, Christmas is just the start of it. Even in reading, the, even reading the, the, the Gospels and reading the account in Luke about the shepherds and reading the account of Matthew about the wise men, it, it was interesting. I started to notice some themes is that we have this misconception. We have this kind of generalized idea. You see the nativity, you, you know, the, the, the little manger and the, and the sheeps and the donkeys, and then you see Joseph and Mary standing there with their halos around their, their heads, and then you see baby Jesus in the feeding trough, and then you see the shepherds on one side, and then you see the wise men on the other side, and this is great grandiose scene, uh, uh, and this is what we get the picture of of Christmas Day. But if you read the account of the Word of God, some interesting thoughts. For one, when the angels came to the shepherds in the book of Luke and, Luke and told them, hey, you know, peace on earth, goodwill towards men, glory to God in the highest. They begin to tell the shepherds about Jesus. The shepherds went and visited Jesus. And they went, to the, they went to the manger, they went to where Jesus was at, and they visited Jesus, and they saw Jesus, the Bible tells us, continuing on in that story, that the shepherds left rejoicing, telling everybody about what they heard and what they had seen. There's an interesting thought right about there, is that, listen, they didn't stop when Jesus was born. They didn't stop at the manger and go, oh, okay, we made it here, story's over, baby Jesus is born. That was the beginning, that was the starting line of what the shepherds did. See, the shepherds, after they had left Jesus, went and told everybody, went and shouted it out, went and told all that they could tell about what they had seen and what they had heard, carrying on that spirit of Christmas now that the Savior had been born. Another thought is that the wise men, we think about the three wise men, we sing the songs about them, and we don't know, you know, uh, there were three gifts is what we really know. There were three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But the interesting thing is, is that in Matthew, the account of the wise men tells us a little bit of a, uh, uh, t- uses some different words and some different vernacular than what we would assume given the nativity scene of baby Jesus laying in the little feeding trough in the hay. The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew that the wise men visited Jesus in his house, not in the manger. So so that implies that Mary and Joseph had moved beyond that manger scene now to somewhere else. And it says, when he was a child. So the wise men may not have necessarily, more than likely, most than likely, did not visit Jesus on Christmas Day. Continuing on the idea of the spirit of Christmas. Yet, some years later, what do I say some years later? Well, because when Herod got the word about Jesus, Herod sent out a decree in the Bethlehem district to kill all the young males from the age of two and under. You see, so some time had passed before the wise men saw the star. It was a 700-mile journey, so that probably took them a month right there to get out here or to get out towards wherever Jesus was at. They followed the star. They had to do their thing. And, you know, so time had passed. So the Christmas story went well beyond the nativity scene. And today I want to take some things and I want to take some, some ideas and some of the things that I have experienced the holiday seasons. You know, and for me, I can say that this holiday season came crashing by so fast. I think the fact that my wife and I had a baby girl in the beginning of, of December. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Pastor Debbie, she announced it at GNO, and I think on the weekend uh, when Emma was born, there were some complications. She's good now, but she spent 10 days in the, in the intensive care. So, you know, my wife and I were bouncing back and forth, taking care of our two-year-old son at home and then driving from there to the hospital to feed Emma and to, to spend some time with her, and we did that for 10 days. And finally, she came home after 10 days, and so then we had to do that whole adjustment period that parents go through when the, baby's, uh, when the baby comes home, you know, that the whole thing of no sleep, you remember that? Yeah, so if you see Pastor Luke with, with bags under his eyes or maybe if I'm yawning a little bit more than, than a normal person, well, you give me a little bit of mercy, you know why. But the fact of the matter is, is my wife and I looked at each other last night as we were driving away, driving away from my parents' house, that was the conclusion of our Christmas, and we looked at each other and thought, man, 
Christmas had gone by already. We'd missed it. We didn't, because of Emma, we didn't go to anybody's Christmas parties. We didn't go, my wife and I missed Gino because Emma was born the day before Gino. We didn't go to the staff Christmas party that I'm a part of planning here at the church because I was on, uh, Emma had just come home and we were spending time with her. I didn't get to go to any of the other things. And I was like, man, we were like, the festive season was kind of different for us because we just didn't, there wasn't, it was just different. It took me, you know, I didn't put my Christmas lights up until like a week before Christmas. And then I was like, ah, I'm going to take them down in five days, you know. And, and that, that festivity about Christmas wasn't there. But even inside of me, even though I didn't have all the commercialization of Christmas, you know what I'm talking about when I say the commercialization? When it wasn't about all the doodads and the doodats and, the, and upping my neighbor's decorations and, and making sure that my tree looks better than in my window than, and, and doing all these different things and following all these things. But there was behind all of that, you strip away all of the things that come with Christmas, the excess in shopping and eating and everything like that, there was a spirit behind it. And I found myself beginning to sing Christmas carols. And I, I don't sing. I, you know, Pastor Luke does not sing. You might see me up on the front row. I lip sync, okay? I, I like Millie Vanilli. You know, so you're not going to hear a lot of things coming out of my mouth because, hey, there's just some things that are better left unsung. But, I, you know, there were some songs in my heart, and I began to sing, and, I, and there was a little bit of pep in my step. Even though we were going through a hard time with our little baby girl, there was something in there. And, you know, there's a spirit behind Christmas. There's a celebration that comes behind Christmas. And that's what I want to focus on when I talk about keeping the spirit of Christmas. I don't care about the commercialization. Hey, I don't even care about the date of Christmas. But what I want to talk about is the spirit of Christmas. When those angels came to the shepherds as, uh, in the fields and they said, to glory, they said to them, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth and goodwill towards men. And they told them about Jesus. When the, when the wise men came to Jesus and they laid down gold, frankincense, and myrrh at, at, at Jesus' feet because of the honor to give to him because there was a value in there. That's what I want to talk about. There was a reason that everything happened, and there's some things that we can take from Christmas. Now, I know that some of you in this place may not have had a good Christmas. Some of you may have had a, had a lonely Christmas, or you may have experienced your first Christmas without a loved one or something of that nature. But even throughout the hard times, there's things that we can take away from the Christmas season and things that I want to share with you today about why we can take away the spirit of Christmas and turn those, those hard memories or those hard times into joyful times during the holiday season because there's, there's reason for it. So today I want to take you with four, four different thoughts, things that I had experienced this year uh, uh, in the spirit of Christmas and how we can live them and why we should live them throughout the year, beyond December 25th, beyond January, beyond February, well into the summertime, well into the fall, and then back into Christmas again, and that we would maintain this, this attitude or this spirit of Christmas all throughout our lives. So today I'm going to talk about keeping the spirit of Christmas, and there's four things that I want to share with you. Number one, this afternoon, or this evening, number one in keeping the spirit of Christmas is generosity. You know, in Christmas there's a spirit of generosity, whether or not you feel generous or not, there is a spirit of generosity. The fact is, is that when you walk into the church, you see that spirit right off the bat. Why? Because you saw that there were bins for the convalescent ministry, and, and people gave into those. And there were bins for the homeless ministry. There were trees in the foyer that had children's names on them, that had gifts that those children wanted to get that they may not have, had, they may not have gotten if somebody didn't buy that gift for them other than their family. And yet 921 children here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center got gifts because of your participation. There was a generous spirit in Christmas. Now, I'll be the first to admit, amongst my family, Pastor Luke has a certain reputation when it comes to finances. Pastor Jim and Pastor Deborah are the givers of the family. Pastor Jess and Pastor Dan are the givers of the family. Pastor Luke and his wife Stacy are the cheapskates of the family. All right, I, don't, I, I tell my family, I'm like, man, I'm not cheap. I'm just frugal. But, you know, <laughs> regardless of where you are with money, regardless of where you are with finances, Christmas comes with a spirit of generosity. You give things. Hey, I was just telling my wife the other day, we had the sea of Christmas cards on our table. And I thought, man, I asked my wife this question the other day because, just like, again, we're, I'm frugal. I see the 42-cent cost of a stamp, and I'm like, man, everybody, I got 40 Christmas cards that people mailed to me. They could have just handed it to me at the church. Why do they go through all this effort of doing this? Or why don't they just, well, you know, and I'm asking my wife this, but there's a spirit of generosity of saying, from my family to yours, Merry Christmas. We want to share things. We want to give things. You've heard, you've probably been taught as a child that it's better to what? Give 
than receive. So there's that, in, in, that, there's that indoctrination of generosity in the Christmas season, but far beyond the commercialization, far beyond what your parents told you as a child, there is a spirit of generosity in the Christmas season. And you and I ought to carry that spirit of generosity in our hearts, in our lives, in our actions, in our thoughts, in, our, in whatever we do. We ought to carry that thought of generosity every day of the year. The reaching out and the giving out. You know, it doesn't necessarily relate to finances, but maybe it does. You've got your Bibles. Turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. Turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians in the ninth chapter. And as you go to the book of 2 Corinthians in the ninth chapter, we're talking about generosity. I'm going to put up on the overhead... Proverbs, the 11th chapter. Proverbs, the 11th chapter, in the 25th verse, says that the generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. So when you give, when you water, when you give out to water the plant, like the, like the author of Proverbs is, is laying out this illustration, when you pour out something and give into the, into the plant, hey, the dirt sucks the water up, am I right? When you water a plant, the water's gone, it goes into the dirt. You ain't getting the water back, you're getting mud back if you try to take it back. But the Bible tells us that he who waters will himself be watered. When you give, uh, it comes back to you. But look what we see in 2 Corinthians in the ninth chapter. Paul the Apostle is exhorting the church in Corinth. And he's talking to them in, in verses 1 through 5. He's talking about boasting. And he's talking about bringing uh, um, some people with him and so, that the, so that the church can be an example. In verse number 5 he talks about they made a gift. They had made a promise. Uh, they had made a sacrifice together. And, they, and he was exhorting them not to forget the gift that they had promised to give. And not do it out of obligation or with a, with a, a grudging heart. But to give cheerfully. And look what it says in verse number 6 of the ninth chapter. It says, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. But he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. You see, I've got that, I've got that whole thing highlighted here, but it says as he purposes in your heart. There's something about that spirit that's in your heart, the, the, the word of God, the, the spirit of, the, of God speaking to each and every one of us in our hearts saying to give out, to do something, to reach out. And he says, let each one of them give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God, and we, we say this verse every week, so you might know this, you might see this familiar, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. He goes on later on in the, in, the, in the verses further on to say that God would increase the fruits of your righteousness. And he goes on to say, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. You see, the spirit of generosity comes from Christmas. It's born into Christmas. It's, it's indoctrinated into Christmas. It is inseparable from Christmas because Christmas in itself is the act of generosity towards God or from God towards us by giving us his son, Jesus Christ. You see, so God gave us the most generous gift of all, Jesus Christ. So now that, that, that feeling of generosity, that spirit of generosity is inside of us. And here, while he might be talking about finances, while he might be talking about gifts, hey, listen, why don't you and I take that spirit of generosity and extend it throughout the year? We forget about Christmas. It's easy. It comes naturally to, oh, who do I got to get gifts? I got to give them, 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 them. And they might get me a gift, so I got to give them a gift because I don't want them to give me a gift. And, and you start thinking about it, and you're spending money on gifts. But why not take the thought of, hey, well, if I get from them or they get from me or I got to get from them because that's, that was the name I drew on the secret Santa card or whatever it might be. Why not take that throughout the year and say, you know what, I'm going to give of, of myself. It may cost you money. Hey, I'm going to give some of my money. I'm going to give some of my, how about this, my time. I'm going to give some of my effort. I'm going to give some of my prayers. I'm going to give some of my uh, emotions or some of my self to somebody else or for somebody else in the spirit of generosity. Why? Because God gave us the most indescribable gift, Jesus Christ, his son. And we've got to carry that gift or that spirit of generosity throughout the year to not just close off from Christmas and say, okay, Christmas is over. Now it's time to get to the grindstone. Now, now it's time for us to really live the example that God has given us. Not just one day, but the 364 other days. Are you with me tonight? We're talking about keeping the spirit of Christmas. The second thought that, uh, that came to me uh, when, it, when it came to the spirit of Christmas was thoughtfulness. 
The, the, spirit, the spirit of thoughtfulness. You know, there's something about Christmas that it brings a thoughtfulness. You know, I mean, you know about it. You, the, even the Christmas carols and the Christmas songs start talking about that and start, you start reaching out to families. Hey, listen, yesterday my cell phone was buzzing off the hook from everybody sending me text messages saying, Merry Christmas to you and yours. Merry Christmas to the family. Merry Christmas for me. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Mer-. I mean, I just, they just kept coming in and they just kept coming in. My emails on Facebook and all the different mediums that we communicate with each other today, were, they were just being filled with messages of Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. You see, on one day we start to think about, well, who's important to me? On that one day we start to think about, well, who, who do I need to let them know that I'm thinking about them. And we start going through our list and we start looking at our loved ones and our friends and our families and our co-workers and the people that we care about or that are near and dear to our heart and we reach out to them. We send them Christmas cards or we give them uh, uh, um, c- baskets of cookies or hey, hallelujah, tamales. And, 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 we, uh, and we reach out to them and we, there's, a, there's, a th- there's a statement there saying, hey, listen, I wanted you to know that I'm thinking about you on this holiday season. But what about once Christmas is over? What about December 26th? What about February 19th? What about August 3rd? What about September 12th? How about on those days, the spirit of thoughtfulness about picking up the phone or sending out a card or a postcard or sending out an email or just reaching out to somebody and say, hey, listen, I just wanted you to know that I was thinking of you. To say, hey, listen, God thought I was special enough to think of me and send me his son, Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that I think you're special enough that I prayed for you today. That I thought of you today. That I wanted to reach out and do something for you today. That I wanted to go and invite you to a cup of coffee or, or take you out to a lunch or, or to meet you somewhere and just spend some time with you to think about you, to let you know that you are valuable to me. See, the idea of being thoughtful replaces the idea of being selfish. We get so wrapped up in our worlds, we get so wrapped up in everything that we do that we move past the idea of somebody else and we think solely upon ourselves. What can I do? Well, I got to work, I got to do this, I got to do that. I got Monday through Friday, this, and then on my weekends. Then I got to do soccer and I got to go to here and I got to do this with the kids. And I got three hours on my own and I just don't got time to give that person any more of my time. I don't have time to reach out to that person. I don't, it's too awkward. When I call them, every time I ask them how they're doing, they got something new that's going on and I'm just tired of hearing about it. But you know, the fact of the matter is, is that when we act out of thoughtfulness for somebody else and we give of our time, like we talked about in, in, in that generosity, and we give of our efforts to let somebody else know that we were thinking about them, that we appreciated them, that they were valuable to us, what that does is it removes the selfishness that's inherent in our lives. Are you with me tonight? Uh, you're, in, you're in the book of 2 Corinthians. Turn a couple pages back. Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians in the 12th chapter. We were just here in the 11th chapter on Monday as we had Christmas communion. And now we're in the 12th chapter. I'm, I'm, I'm reading from the 12th chapter. And Paul the Apostle is talking to the church and he's talking to them and gives them the illustration or the idea uh, of, like I used in our prayer this, this afternoon or this evening, that we are many members of one body. And Paul says to the church, he says, you know, we're, we're many members. Not everybody's the hands, not everybody's the feet, not everybody's the eyes, not everybody's this and that. There's many different parts to the body, but they all come together to make up the body. And if, if everybody wanted to be the hands or the eyes, he says, well, then where would the ears be? And if everybody wanted to be the ears, then where would the nose be? And, and so we all have parts to play, and that's why we're all uniquely different, and God created us that way. But as we come together, we create the body of Christ and whom we are representing, and we become that body. And look what Paul says in the 20th verse of the 12th chapter. Paul says, But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather these members of the body, which seem to be weaker, are necessary. How about this thought? He's talking about the the weaker members of the body, the things of the body that you don't necessarily think about. I mean, when was the last time, I don't know, you gave your spleen the thought? When was the last time you thought about, wow, liver, I'm so grateful that you're in my body doing what you do? We think about our hands and we think, man, I'm so glad I've got my digits. And we think about our feet and so glad I've got my balance. We think about our eyes. I'm so glad that I can still see colors. But when do we think about the lesser vessels in our body? And he says, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. 
And our unpresentable parts have a greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. Now listen to what he says. Listen to what he goes on to say in verse number 25. He says that there should be no schism in the body, that there should be no gap, or there should be no separation in the body, that the members should all have, listen to this, the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. If we took that idea of thoughtfulness, of, of, of reaching out to the people, maybe reaching out to people that we haven't talked to in years, maybe calling that person that you haven't talked to but they've been on your heart and praying for them and, and maybe sending them an email or, or sending them a Facebook or whatever else you might do and saying, hey, listen, I just wanted you to know Merry Christmas or it, if it's not Christmas and say, hey, happy July 12th. I'm thinking about you, and I just wanted you to know. And to celebrate each other and to celebrate the fact that we're all different, but we all come together and we all serve a purpose in the body of Christ and that we should all celebrate with each other's triumphs and we should all be together in times of heartache and, and pain because we are all members of one body together. So we're talking about the spirit of Christmas, and we've talked about generosity. We've talked about thoughtfulness and, and carrying on that theme. Jesus told us that we would be known as his disciples, that they would know us by our love, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to love one another. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you. And he tells us that we have got to love, and through our love, we show our thoughtfulness. We show, hey, listen, I'm thinking about you. Hey, listen, I'm, I'm doing this for you. Hey, I just wanted you to know I prayed for you today. One of the things that I like to do in my life is, is on some of the times that when I meet somebody in the, the first time visitors lounge or on, on Friday night in our young adult service, a lot of times somebody will ask me to pray for them. I'll ask them about their name and then what I'll try to remember to do or if somebody asks me to praise, I'll pray with them right there because I always say, hey, listen, you can never get enough prayer. But then after that, I try to go home and I try to remember. I write their name down or I write something about them down and I pray for them during the week. I pray for them in the morning or I pray for them uh, a couple days after we prayed again just so that I can remember them and I can take time out of my own time to say, hey, listen, this person had something going on in their life that they asked me to pray. They trusted me enough to pray for their situation. So I'm not going to just stop at once. I'm going to pray twice, three times, four times. I'm going to pray as often as much as I can because they're valuable to me just like I was valuable to God. And they will know us by our love. Le uh, third thing for tonight, we're talking about keeping the spirit of Christmas. The third thought for tonight is gratitude, is a spirit of gratitude. You know, as Christmas rolls around for me, I think especially this year because uh, I had a little baby girl on Christmas and I just could relate to the idea of Jesus Christ being a, a baby coming in the form of a man and just and, and, and with such humble beginnings, there's a, there's a sense of gratitude of saying, God, I'm just grateful that I've got what I've got. If you, if you have family at Christmas and you're with your family, there's a sense of, you know, you go around the table and you look at your family and, you know, sometimes you feel like you might want to wring their necks, but, you know, you're glad that you got them. And, you know, there's a sense, for those of you who maybe you've been alone on Christmas, I remember there was a, a Christmas season when we were out in, in, in Bible college and we spent Christmas alone and it was, it was very hard, it was very different, it was very lonely, it was just not the same, but there's, in that sense, that you, you, you become grateful or you can see things or you have the opportunity, let's say, to see what you're grateful for. Well, I'm grateful that I've got this, or I'm grateful that I'm here today. I'm grateful for this. You see, there's a spirit of gratitude. We're grateful for the fact that God loved us so much that he gave us Jesus Christ, his only begotten son. So there's a spirit of gratitude born into Christmas through Jesus Christ. Why? Because God paid the ultimate price by giving his son for us. So therefore, it's brought into us. It's, it, it's, it's adopted in. It's in the DNA of Christmas is gratitude. We can't escape Christmas without being grateful for what God has given us. So it doesn't matter uh, past the commercialization going again, past the traditions of Christmas, past the dinner and the food and the presents and the wrapping paper and the decorations, moving all beyond that, the most, thing, the most that we should be grateful for is the fact that Jesus Christ came for us, that we live in a time where Jesus Christ has come and bought our sin and our death and our shame and nailed it to the cross along with himself on that cross on Calvary and bore our sickness. We should be grateful for the fact that the Bible tells us that when we are sick by the stripes of Jesus Christ that we are healed. You see, God didn't leave us here with nothing to do or with no hope. Now we have the hope of hopes because we have Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. 
And so there's a spirit of, 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 of gratitude in our lives and in our hearts. You know, in the book of 1 Thessalonians, you're right there in, uh, in Corinthians. Let's turn a couple pages over. Let's go to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians in the 5th chapter, pretty familiar verse. 1 Thessalonians, the 5th chapter, the 16th verse says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Here Paul is speaking to the church and he gives them some guidelines. He says, listen, rejoice always. You've got reason to be happy. In the Christmas season, there are, there's, this is the season where there's the most self-inflicted injuries and self-inflicted deaths, suicides than any other time because people think they have no reason to be happy. But here, the Bible tells us that we should rejoice always. Why? Because we have a reason to be happy. It doesn't matter about the past. It doesn't matter your bad Christmas memories with your mom and your dad because you've got Jesus Christ. You've got the King of Kings. You've got the Lord of Lords. You've got the ultimate price that was paid for you, the ultimate gift. So you have reason to rejoice. But going beyond December 25th, all the way into the, end, into the next year, rejoice always. He's telling them, listen, this isn't some guidelines. This is a lifestyle change. He's telling them, this is the lifestyle you should live, a lifestyle of rejoicing. How about this? A lifestyle of prayer. He says, pray without ceasing. Does that mean that you should pray always and never, never, ever stop? Don't talk to anybody else in the rest of the world. Just keep praying? That's not possible. But the fact of the matter is, is that you don't have to close God off when you say amen. amen. It's not like the phone when you hang up and you say, and then, then, then you, hit, you, hit, you hang up the phone, conversation's over. No, 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 no. You see, God's always there. God's everywhere with us. We have reason to rejoice because the King of kings, the Lord of lords, God Almighty is there with us with his Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, is at the right hand of God making intercession for us. We have the opportunity to continually keep the lines of communication open with God. So Paul says this is a lifestyle. Prayer is a lifestyle. And he goes on to say the third lifestyle adjustment is thanksgiving. To find a reason to be thankful, a reason to be grateful in everything you do. From the little things from God, I thank you that it was raining and I got to sit by a fire today. Or God, I just saw that sunset and it was amazing. Thank you for letting me see that. God, thank you that I'm awake today. God, thank you that I've got a job. God, thank you that I'm going to get a job. Whatever it might be, the Bible says to live a lifestyle of thankfulness, a lifestyle of gratitude. We've got to carry it beyond Christmas. In Colossians 1.12, I'll just put it up on the overhead. Colossians 1 tells us, giving thanks to the Father who has, listen, why should we be thankful? Because we have been qualified. You see, you and I did not qualify. In any sports event, there's qualifications. You've got to qualify, which means you've got to prove that you're capable of competing before you can compete. In any of the, the finals or the, or the semifinals in the basketball and baseball, there's qualifiers. In the Olympics, you've got to qualify before you can even run in the Olympics. Because otherwise, you're not, you're, you see, you and I didn't have the timing. We didn't have the ability. We didn't have the skill. We didn't have the, the, the grace of God. But then all of a sudden it says, giving thanks to God who qualified us. We met the requirements. We are now in the race. We are now participants. And look at what it says, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light, Jesus Christ. So why do we be thankful? It doesn't matter about gifts. I'm not talking about what you got for Christmas. Yeah, tell them thanks. Send them a thank you card. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being thankful for everything that you have because God is a good and great God and God has got your backs and we've got to be grateful for everything we have even though it may not seem like we have anything. We still do. The last one for tonight. Can I do one more? Can we go through one more? Are you all right with me? Last one for tonight is joy. Keeping the spirit of Christmas, number four tonight, is joy. Now this is the one, this is the thought when it comes to Christmas that a lot of people have a hard time with because Christmas has become so uh, traditional or Christmas has become so uh, commercialized. I know from my family and I, you know, we have to bounce from one house to the next house on all the holidays. So it's like we got to get up, we got to get the kids together, we got to be here at a certain time and then we got to leave at this place at a certain time and it's always in the middle of something that we're leaving and then we got to drive across town and we got to go to this place at a certain time and, we, and there's a schedule and we're stressed out and we're, and we're huffing and puffing and we're trying to get things and you, you lose the idea behind it. 
But the, the, the truth is, is that there's, there's a joy behind that. Whether you feel it or not, the fact is, is there's, there's a joy ingrained in this. As the angels were visiting the shepherds, they were singing. The, you heard the choruses. The shepherds heard the choruses of angels singing to God. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth and goodwill towards men. They were praising God. There's a joy. The hallelujah chorus. Hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? Was going on in the background. That's why I don't sing. <laughs> There's a joy built into Christmas. And because it's built into Christmas, that's often the time why it's so hard for people to have joy in their lives because they see somebody else's joy or they see somebody else with their family or they see somebody else getting a bunch of presents and they don't have it. They don't have the family or they lost a loved one or, or they're alone or they're cold on that Christmas. They don't have anything with them. But the fact of the matter is, you see, we got to shed that idea. Because when Jesus was born, it wasn't about going to Walmart. It wasn't about going to Target on Black Friday and getting gifts. When Jesus was born, the shepherds were in the night cold. They were alone too. The wise men journeyed from 700 some miles. They had a long distance to travel. Ain't nothing like me driving across town. But there was a joy built into Christmas. So when we shed the commercialization, when we shed what, what everybody tells us, what companies tell us about their products, and, oh, if you have this, or if you eat this, or if it's this way, your Christmas will be better. If you have this many lights, and if you put the new LED lights that are synced to music, and you can control them from your phone, you'll have the best Christmas ever. If you, if you, get, the, if you get the train this year on your Christmas tree, or if you get the, the, the elf that jumps around everywhere, I don't know what that was all about. Your, your Christmas will be great. You see, it's not about that. Joy comes from God. And our celebration and our cause from joy is not about an event. It's not about vacation. It's not about time off from work or time with family. It has nothing to do with that. The joy comes from the fact that God gave us Jesus Christ. Our joy. I remember in the Old Testament, I don't even have this on the overhead, it just comes to my mind, as Nehemiah was reading the book of the law to the people after building the walls of Jerusalem, they begin to cry, and they begin to sob with sorrow, for they realized what they had done and how they had acted, and Nehemiah told, told, told them, my parents told me all this all my life, that the joy of the Lord would be our strength. That the joy of the Lord would be our strength. You see the angels in heaven singing hallelujah, glory to God, peace on earth, goodwill to men. Let that be my anthem. Let that be my song because there's a joy inside of me, not because of vacation time, not because I'm getting a gift, not because I'm, I'm seeing somebody open something I gave them, but because God thought so much of me to give his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And when we carry that attitude of joy, we as Christians, get this, we as Christians smile. Heaven forbid we look like we're having a good time in Jesus. It's too quiet in this place tonight. I'm moving on. In Psalms, the fifth chapter, verse number 11, I'll put it up on the overhead. It says, but let them who rejoice put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those who also love your name be joyful in you. You see, our joy is not in material possessions. Our joy is not in vacation hours. Our joy is not in the circumstances around us and how good things look at the moment because it may be something different the next day. Our joy is in God. Our joy is in God Almighty who watches over us, who has our back, who sees value in us, who loves us. Our joy is in God. And look what it says Isaiah. Look what it says in Isaiah, the 35th chapter. We'll finish with this. God is speaking to his people, talking about when they return to him. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. You see, joy is not about momentary happiness. It says right there, you will have everlasting joy on your heads. That sorrow and sighing will flee away. You will have such joy in your heart because of God, because of the gifts of God, because of the Spirit of God. Hey, listen, the fruits of the Spirit, joy is one of them. That you have such a joy in your life that sorrow and, and, and sighing would flee away, that it has no room to occupy you because you live a life of joy. 
So church, just like the wise men who came days, years later, just like the shepherds who, as they left, celebrated what they had seen, let us take the spirit of Christmas, even though Christmas is over, even though the carols are off the radio, even though you're tearing down the Christmas tree, trying not to set your house on fire, even though you're getting those Christmas lights off your our house, even though you go back to work, even though your temporary job at work might be over, let's carry the spirit of Christmas beyond the holiday season into January, February, March, April, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, and going on and on and on because when you have a baby... The celebration doesn't stop at birth. It only starts. And church, you and I, our celebration at Christmas shouldn't stop on December 25th, on 6th, but it should start and continue on and on and on and on because we've got a God in heaven who loves us, who gave us everything that we need. We have reason to keep the spirit of Christmas alive. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? a couple more things. I want, to ask, uh, I want to ask you, just give me a moment more of your attention. Please don't get it. Don't walk out. Church is almost out. I want to ask you a question. I, w- I want to, it would be a shame for us to have service today and to, to come together and sing praise and worship and to sing songs to God and to hear a message about the Word of God and the Spirit of Christmas and, and to not give you the opportunity to, 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 to determine whether or not you're going to find yourself in heaven or if you're going to find yourself in hell. You see, it's so important that each and every one of us make that decision and make that that, that uh, choice in our life. So let me ask you this question. Listen, nobody's going to know this answer except you and God, not the person next to you, not the person that you came with. Nobody's going to know this except you and God. If you were to leave this place tonight and you were to die, heaven forbid, and you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a relatively simple question, but why don't we go over some of your answers in this, in this place tonight? You know, you might have said, well, Pastor Luke, you know, to be honest with you, I'm not sure where I stand on the existence of heaven or where I stand on the existence of hell. I, I just don't know if, if I believe that it's real. I, I, there's a God, I think, somewhere out there, but I just, I'm not sure about all this stuff. Hey, listen, let me tell you something. Just because you may not think that heaven is real or because you may not believe that hell is real or eternal doesn't mean it's not. Hey, listen, I love you enough, I respect you enough, I honor you enough to tell you the truth that just because so you say something or just because you think that there might be a God out there somewhere, that's not good enough and that's not going to get you into heaven. That's like saying I don't believe in semi-trucks, maybe because you never saw one or somebody told you that semi-trucks never existed. You'd go out and stand on the slow lane of the freeway, and lo and behold, you'd meet a semi-truck face to face. You see, heaven is a real place. Hell is a very real place. And I love you enough, I respect you enough, and I honor you enough to not play games with you tonight, to be honest, to be in your face about it, and to tell you that you need to change your thinking, that hell is a real place, heaven's a real place, and you can't escape it because you don't believe it. It's just not that way. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I think I'm going to get to heaven. I sure hope so. I really want to get to heaven. Hey, did you know nowhere in the Word of God can you find that you're going to think your way into heaven? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that you can hope that you're going to get to heaven? Hey, nowhere in the Word of God does God look at you and say, wow, he wanted it or she wanted it bad enough. I'm going to let him into heaven because they wanted it bad enough. Hey, listen, just because you think you're going to get to heaven, just because you hope you're going to get to heaven, or just because you want to get to heaven, doesn't mean that you're going to get there. There's more to it than that, and we'll talk about it in just a moment. You know, you might say, well, but Pastor Luke, I wasn't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, as a Muslim, or any other type of uh, world religion or anything like that. I was born in America. America is a Christian nation. Our money says, in God we trust. So doesn't that mean that I'm going to get to heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, or as a Muslim, or if you weren't raised as any other type of world religion or philosophical thought, can you show me where it says that because you were born in America, because the money you carry in your wallet says, in God God we trust, that you're going to get to heaven? Hey, nowhere in the word of God will you find that because you can't get to God that way. You can't get to heaven that way. You know, you might have said, well, Pastor Luke, I was baptized as a child. I was christened. I went to Sunday school or Sabbath school classes. My parents told me all my life that I was a Christian. We attended church on Christmas and on Easter, and here I am tonight. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me the word of God where it says that because you were baptized that you're going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says in the word of God that because somebody blew smoke and water over you as a child, because somebody prayed a prayer over you that you're going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says in the word of God that because uh, your parents told you that you were a Christian, that because you sat in church that you're going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says that in the word of God? No, where will you find that? It's just not that way. Well, I've got, I got one. I got one. Well, Pastor Luke, I'm a good person. Good people 
go to heaven. You know, I've never cheated on my taxes. I've never robbed the 7-Eleven. I've done more good in my life than bad. I've even given to charitable organizations like the Red Cross. You know, doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that because you're a good person that you're going to get into heaven, that good people go to heaven? Nowhere in the Word of God will, it say, will you find that because you never cheated on your taxes, because you give to charitable organizations, because you live a good life that you're going to get into heaven. You won't find that in the Bible. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that according to God, our good deeds are like filthy rags. You see, nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get to heaven. We can't try, we can try, we can try, but no matter how hard we try, we'll never be good enough to get into heaven because it's not about how good you are, about how good of a life you are, about how few curse words you say throughout your life. It's not about that. There's more to, to getting to heaven than just living a good life. As a matter of fact, a man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he asks Jesus. In the book of John, you can read it for yourself in the third chapter. He asks Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? What do I have to do to get into heaven? You would think that Nicodemus, based on who he was and what he did, that Jesus' response to Nicodemus was, Nicodemus, you just keep on going. Great is your reward in heaven. You're going to make it there. I'll tell you, it's going to be great. I'll see you there. Why would I say that? Because the Bible tells us that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. The Bible says that Nicodemus was a leader of the Jews. So what that means to you and I is that Nicodemus had dedicated his young life, probably the first 20 years of his life, to studying and to memorizing Scripture. You know, Nicodemus had more scripture memorized than you and I could think imaginable. Nicodemus wore all the right clothes. He said all the right things. He did all the right things. He, he gave to the poor. You know, he taught in the temple uh, the word of God. Nicodemus was a good person. And you would think because of that that Jesus would say, you great is your reward in heaven. Hey, you would think that because you attended church, you would think that because you volunteered in a children's ministry or you served in the choir or you were a youth worker. Hey, you would think because you've memorized John 3, 16 or a few other verses that God would say, great, good, I'm glad you made the effort. Great is your reward in heaven. But Jesus says to Nicodemus something else. He says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, what does that mean? You've heard that term. You think of, ah, oh, radical, crazy, out of control, weirdo Christianity. But let me tell you something. I don't care what Hollywood or popular culture or society has made out of that term. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing in the eyes of God. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with God. God's not after your mental ascent towards him. Hey, 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 look at me, look at me. God's not after your carnal knowledge of who he is. You can't go anywhere in America and ask somebody if they don't know who Jesus Christ is. It's more to it than that. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who Jesus is. The devil quoted scripture. But yet, he's not on his way to heaven. You see, there's more than your carnal ascent or your mental knowledge of who God is. God's after all of your heart. God's after all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. That's what he's after in order for you to get into heaven. Let me prove it to you again in the, book of, in the book of Revelation. The last book of the Bible, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church. People like you and I gather together doing good things, hearing the word of God. And he says to the church, when I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Whoa. Shocking statement designed to get your attention. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that only lukewarm Christians will be rejected and ejected out of the kingdom of God. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship and he does not want to find you living lukewarm in your life. You are deceived in thinking you're going to get to heaven. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me define it for you in terms of your relationship. Lukewarm means this. It means that you're a little bit up, you're a little bit down, a little bit in, a little out, kind of floating around in your relationship with God. Occasional church attendance. Maybe you got a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. Maybe you got a Jesus tattoo on your back or your shoulder when you were a kid and you say you call yourself a Christian. You wear religious jewelry, doing a little bit of your own thing, doing a little bit of God's thing. The fact of the matter is, is that lukewarm means you're riding the fence. You're right down the middle, doing some of your thing, doing some of God's thing. And God says, hey, listen, if it's not an all or nothing, if it's, a, if it's right down the middle, if you're riding the fence, you are deceived in thinking that you're going to make it into heaven. So then what do we do? How do we get to heaven? You know, we can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. Can't get there some well-meaning author's way. Can't get there your way. Can't get there my way. The only way we can do is get there God's way. You see, it's God's heaven. It's God's way. And God sent his son, Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ said this about himself. He said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to the Father in heaven except through him. So we can't do it any other way. We have to do it God's way, Jesus Christ's way. 
So what I'm going to do in a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to smack my hand on my Bible. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. Smack my hand on the Bible just like that. When I smack my hand on the Bible, if you want to give your heart, you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to be bold. I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up, and we'll do it all together at the same time when I count to three. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, you know what, Pastor Luke, I acknowledge that I want to give Jesus Christ. I want to give him all of my heart. I want to give him all of my life. I want to leave hell behind, and I want to ensure my place in heaven today. You say, Pastor Luke, if I raise my hand, I can't do that. Somebody I came with, the person behind me is going to see me. They're going to know I'm going to be embarrassed. Hey, I'm not going to embarrass you, but you might be embarrassed. But wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell? You see, the decision's yours. God has already done everything he could. He's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way in. He did everything he could to ensure you got to heaven by giving you, Jesus Christ, his most valuable possession to die a beaten, bloody mess, a spectacle hung on the cross for all to see. All you have to do is accept him with your heart and your life. The Bible tells us if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before your father. If you deny him before men, he'll deny you before his father. You see, don't miss the opportunity today because of embarrassment. You miss the opportunity, you find yourself in hell. You'd raise whatever you could. You'd do whatever you could to get out of that place. But by raising your hand, by saying you want to give Jesus Christ all of your heart, all of your life, you're turning a new leaf, turning a new page, and you're ensuring that your destiny is in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever. The decision's yours. God's already done everything he could. Now it's up to you. You say, Pastor Luke, man, you've really spent a lot of time on this. You're really pressuring me. Hey, let me tell you something. Tell that to the devil who's pressuring you to not make this decision. Here I am, standing in front of you. I love you enough. I respect you enough to be a spectacle, to pressure you, to put pressure on you to make this decision because I care enough about your eternal life to do this. So let's shed what we think about. Let's shed the emotion. Let's shed the embarrassment today. Let's make sure that you get forward. You go forward in your relationship with God. Who should raise their hand? If you've never given him all your heart, you've never given him all your life, in a moment, get your hand up. Who should raise their hand if you've never professed them publicly, you've never walked down the aisle, you've never done anything like that? In a moment, get your hand up. You say, man, maybe I did this as a kid. I don't know. If that's you in this place, in a moment, get your hand up. And finally, who should raise their hand? If you've been living lukewarm, been doing your own thing instead of God's thing, if you've been riding the fence, hey, look it, let's make December 26th the day that you go forward for God and you get yourself hot for God and you ensure your destiny in heaven with Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever and ever. The decision's yours. All across this auditorium, hands, if that's you getting ready to go up. I'm going to count to three. If that's you, be bold. Get your hand up so I can see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down, and we'll move forward from there. Here we go. If that's you, get ready. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in the house tonight. Let me see your hands in the house tonight. Is there anybody in the house, anybody here tonight? I see you. One, two, three, four. I see you right there. Five. I see you right there. Five wise people. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Is everybody on this side? It's everybody on, nobody on this side? Come on, where are you at? Anybody else? Five wise people. You say, man, I wonder if I should. You know what? Today, you should. Let's move forward today. I see Isaac, you pointing over here somewhere. Is there another hand? Six in the family room. I see you over there. Six wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? You say, I want to give them all my heart. I want to give them all my life. You're thinking, man, I wonder if I should do this. You should do this. You're thinking, man, I wonder if this guy is ever going to shut up. Hey, maybe you ought to get your hand up tonight. Quit playing games with God. Anybody else in the house tonight? Anybody else tonight? Six wise people. I didn't embarrass them. I'm not going to embarrass you. Anybody else? Come on, on this side. Don't tell me. I'm feeling you over here. I want to close this up. But I'm feeling you over here. You're saying, man, I just, I don't think I can. Is anybody on this side? I'm telling you, I feel it. I'm not going to force you. But I will pressure you because the devil's pressuring you to shut up right now. Anybody on this side? Anybody else? Six wise people. All right, well, praise God for six wise people. Here's what I'm going to do for those of you who raised your hands and those of you who should have raised your hands. Maybe you didn't, you were too afraid or you just couldn't get over it. Hey, listen, I'll tell you what, you haven't yet missed your opportunity. In a moment, here's what I'm going to do. We're going to all stand together in just a moment. We're going to sing a song. As we're singing that song, I want to ask you to be bold. You said you were going to give him all of your heart. You said you were going to give him all your life. Let us help you. Let us pray with you today. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ. You acknowledge that you want to get saved by raising your hand. 
So I'm going to ask you to be bold as we all stand now. And if that's you, if you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Get from the family rooms, from the back, from the front. doesn't matter who you are. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Get in the aisle and come meet me up here. Let's change destinies together. If that's you in this place, come on. You can come. Come on. You can come. Come on. Come on. If you raise your hands from the front to the back, come on down. Listen, I want to introduce some, I'm going to introduce a friend to you, a, a friend of mine to you. This is Pastor Joel. See Pastor Joel right over here? Pastor Joel is a super nice guy. What's going to happen is you don't get saved by raising your hand. You get, you get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, come into your life. So Pastor Joel is going to take you right over there. I promise nothing weird goes on. I'm as weird as it gets, okay? He's going to take you right over there, and he's going to lead you in a prayer, okay? He's going to do some things. He's going to give you some free things, some literature. Our senior pastor, Pastor Jim, wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny. He says, hey, I just got saved. Now what do I do? Where do I go from here? Helps you get strong in the ways of the Lord. Kind of points you in the right direction so you don't go back to what you came from. And secondly, the, the, the second thing he's going to do, or the third thing he's going to do, actually, he's going to invite you into a program that we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You know, you go to the gym, you hire a personal trainer, they make sure that you work the right muscles, and they make sure that what you're doing, you're doing it right, and you're doing it efficient, so you're not wasting time. Well, we've got Spiritual Personal Trainers, a friend, somebody that will meet with you right before service, they'll buy you a cup of coffee over in the Love Rock Cafe, they'll meet with you for a couple, uh, couple minutes, 15, 20 minutes, and they'll teach you some things about the Word of the Lord to get you strong in the ways of the Lord, to help make sure that you're, you're putting your effort in the right direction so that you don't go back to the junk that you came from. So if you would just go right over here with Pastor Joel. 